to interview many of the defendants prior to the Nuremberg trials, including Adolf Hitler's number two man, Hermann Goering. He authored a number of books, including The Bridge at Remagen, um, as well as Working with Truman, a personal memoir of the White House years, reprinted in 1996 by University of Missouri Press, as well as Hero of the Rhine, the Carl Timmerman story, published in 2004. Uh, he f uh, f uh, was a former White House assistant to pr um, President Truman and has served in the United States Congress as the U.S. representative from West Virginia. We're delighted to welcome him here for some personal reflections. I am prejudiced. I am prejudiced, unlike these well-balanced historians that you've heard from. I am prejudiced because, uh, as I'll show you in a few uh, overheads here, I worked uh, for President Truman. And uh, this uh, first one, uh, uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas every year, President Truman used to go down to Key West. And uh, he's uh, sitting over there on the right, and I'm holding the uh, life preserver called Truman's Beach. Uh, next one. And uh, he and Mrs. Truman and Margaret loved to have picnics on the uh, little White House lawn. And uh, uh, you have President Truman, Mrs. Truman, uh, Margaret. Um, well, I had sort of a crush on Margaret, if you promise Mike not to pass that on to uh, uh, but uh, if if you fall in love with the president's daughter you know the secret service is always watching you and uh, particularly if you want to go on a date uh, and uh, then John Steelman and I'm number five uh, okay next one uh, this is a photo which a uh, during the 1952 campaign when President Truman was uh, trying to get Adlai Stevenson elected. Stevenson always said when he's running against Eisenhower, it was sort of like running against George Washington. And uh, a photographer from Life magazine, who was a good friend of mine, said one day uh, when President Truman was speaking, that's a Secret Service man on the left, he said, uh, why don't you go up there and stand next to the, the uh, uh, podium and uh, I'll take a picture of you. Well, unfortunately, it makes me look a little bit bigger than the president, but let's, let's see th the next one. Oh, this is a letter which uh, President Truman wrote me when I got elected to Congress in 1958. You notice his P.S. Uh, Sorry I was out when you called, tried to call you back, but new congressmen are harder to talk to than former presidents. <laughs> That's typical Truman-esque. Uh, Next one, um, um, oh, uh, you know, uh, when I first ran for Congress in 1958, I'd only been in the state for one year. Uh, I was actually born up in New York, just like uh, Jay Rockefeller was. Uh, and uh, so when I said in my campaign that I used to work uh, for Harry Truman, Oh, yeah, they all said, uh, you probably opened mail in the basement of some obscure federal building, but uh, President Truman came to West Virginia to uh, uh, put them straight. Uh, let's see, is that all? One more. One more? Yeah. Oh. Vandy Fair, in its uh, uh, April issue, had a photo of the three surviving members of the Truman administration, and... Uh, in the upper left is Milton Kale, who was in the Steelman orbit, and George Elsie, who uh, was really one of the uh, great pillars of strength in the Truman administration. He worked in the map room, uh, even starting as early as Franklin Roosevelt. And of course, he was the famous uh, author of the famous uh, Clifford Elsie report, where President Truman had asked uh, 
uh, Clark Clifford to prepare a list of all the agreements that the Soviet Union had violated, and Clifford gave the job to Elsie, and Elsie decided uh, he should not only list the agreements violated, but he ought to, ought to go into the entire history of Soviet-American relations, and he came out with a what was essentially a blueprint for the Cold War, and uh, uh, okay, we can have the lights back up, and thank you, Ryan. Um, but those are some of the reasons why I'm very prejudiced. Um, uh, but uh, I was sitting in the hotel lobby this morning uh, reading this book, uh, and a tall man came up to me and said, Hey, uh, I notice you're reading my book. Uh, and uh, this is how I got acquainted with the author, uh, uh, Reverend Miss Campbell. And um, I think uh, there is great room, uh, uh, Dr. Devine, for uh, more Truman scholarship, uh, providing it's not revisionist. I just hope that they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope they draw the line at that. Uh, uh, I believe in the First Amendment to the Constitution and freedom of speech, and let them keep writing that, but uh, we don't have to pay too much attention to it. Now, um, um, I am really intimidated uh, to be asked here to give uh, concluding remarks on people that really know what they're talking about, uh, Professor Smalling and uh, uh, Dr. Weisner, Professor Ms. Campbell. And with all you talented people here, it, of course, reminds me of the time when uh, President Kennedy was uh, uh, <coughs> assembling all the winners of the Nobel Prize at the White House for dinner, and he said, this is the greatest collection of talent since the time when Thomas Jefferson dined here alone. And uh, I appreciate the fact that I've been um, given an opportunity to say something, but about all I can say is possibly to supplement a little bit uh, what has been uh, said, uh, Dr. Beisner, I thought your book on Atchison was tremendous, and um, I just wanted to add a couple of supplements. Uh, uh, I had tremendous admiration for Dean Atchison, and um, uh, despite the fact that the president's military aide, General Vaughn, didn't think very much of uh, uh, Atchison, um, one day I went to an Atchison speech in the morning where he ended it with the Episcopalian prayer, we seek the peace which passeth all understanding. And I went back to the White House uh, for lunch. I was sitting next to General Vaughn and uh, I began to soliloquize about what a great man this was and uh, how he had always advised uh, the president uh, 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 in such brilliant terms, and Vaughn poked me in the ribs and said, you know what the trouble with is, is Dean? You know what the trouble with Dean is? Uh, he spends too damn much time with the Sermon on the Mount and not enough with the men on the hill. <laughs> and uh, of course, that was one of uh, Atchison's shortcomings, that uh, he didn't suffer fools lightly, and he made it pretty clear when he got a stupid question from a congressman that uh, he made it very clear in his answer that you could see that uh, uh, he thought it was stupid and the congressman, if he had shaken his head from side to side, his uh, head would have rolled off. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, um, uh, did anybody mention the only West Virginian in the cabinet who was a real disaster. His name was Lewis Johnson. He was uh, Secretary of Defense. And General Vaughn had a good uh, a characterization of uh, Lewis Johnson also. Uh, he said, Secretary Johnson is the only bull I know that carries his own china shop along with him. <laughs> uh, and um, um, Let's see, I was supposed to really get into some substance here, but uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, Dean Atchison told me one day uh, how he got appointed as Secretary of State. 
You know, um, uh, Dr. Beiser makes this point uh, very well that in 1946, when Truman suffered a stinging defeat at the midterm elections and uh, the Republicans recaptured control of both the House and Senate first time since 1928, and uh, not a single member of the President's cabinet was at Union Station to greet him when he returned from voting in Missouri. But the Under Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, alone of all the people was there to greet him, and President Truman appreciated this uh, show of loyalty. And in 1949, um, Acheson told me that uh, President Truman had called him over to Blair House, where he was living, of course, while the White House was being reconstructed. And uh, he said, Dean, I want you to sit down. I have something very, very important to ask of you. And uh, then he said, uh, uh, I want you to be my Secretary of State. And um <coughs> Dean Atchison had said, well, what about uh, William O. Douglas? What about Averill Harriman? What about Lewis Douglas? He mentioned a number of other people. And finally, Truman said, according to Atchison, look, there are at least 10,000 people in this country that are more qualified to be president than I am. But I happen to be president of the United States, and I want you to be my Secretary of State, and that's the end of that. And uh, this was the decision-making uh, characteristic of Truman. I think the um, one area where uh, uh, Truman and Acheson disagreed was in terms of the point four program. Point four is the term applied to Harry Truman's inaugural address of January 20th, 1949, when he was outlining the foreign policy, including support for the United Nations and uh, support for NATO. And point four in that program was extending technical assistance to underdeveloped nations in the form of teachers, health experts, and uh, agricultural experts. And uh, this was a program uh, which was very much opposed by the State Department. And the reason it came to President Truman's attention is a very interesting story in the way bureaucracy operates. There was a young man in the State Department public affairs section named Benjamin Hardy. And Benjamin Hardy wrote a memorandum suggesting that really what we ought to do instead of extending or in addition to extending and supplementing, extending billions of dollars of foreign aid was to send a Peace Corps type uh, program to other nations which could teach them uh, sanitation, health, how to produce better crops and uh, bring teachers into schools, and the top officials in the State Department completely rejected that. They said, uh, that's a silly thing to do. And, and, and so Benjamin Hardy was uh, like whistleblowers uh, throughout our nation. Uh, he decided that, by golly, that was an idea that should not die. And so he went over to the White House and he talked to uh, to George Elsie, and he unveiled the idea, and George Elsie was immediately intrigued by it, and brought it to Clark Clifford, and uh, they then brought it to the president, and President Truman was so intrigued by this thing that had been done underneath the bureaucracy of the State Department, brought to the attention of the White House, that it was included as a primary point in uh, the um, uh, inaugural address of January 20, 1949. And um, uh, Bob, um, what did Atchison uh, feel about this? Atchison thought it was pie in the sky, but he wanted to control it, so he took it. Yeah, he, uh, <laughs> he called it pie in the sky, and uh, uh, it took a long time and pressure from the White House to make sure that the State Department would support appropriations. Um, 
I'm going to pause here in a minute for uh, questions because I know there'll be some good questions. And did they explain to you the, that uh, I'm so hard of hearing at the age of 92, I'm going to have to ask uh, Christian to uh, uh, interpret. Of course, you re really realize the real reason is so I can think about the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> let me think about uh, if there are any other uh, supplements that I can uh, give to uh, what else has been uh, said here. Um, well, I am much more interested in getting your uh, uh, questions, so let me just stop there and see if you yep. have any questions. If you'd like, you would like to sit down. Yeah. In fact, I'd like to invite the other members of the panel up as well. We can open it up for sort of a final round of discussion. Uh, uh, Congressman Heckler has kindly agreed to uh, uh, answer some questions as well. I'll be repeating those into his ear. We can continue also the discussion we began earlier. <coughs> If you could please uh, identify yourself. I'm Don Wolfensberg with the Congress Project here at the Wilson Center. Uh, Congressman Heckler, I was wondering if you might compare uh, Truman's uh, relations with Congress to subsequent presidents uh, uh, that you served under when you were in Congress. Well, uh, one of the things that he uh, had learned, of course, from Woodrow Wilson's failure uh, after World War I. Uh, you know, uh, Wilson came to uh, Versailles with 14 points, and um, the French Prime Minister Clemenceau had said, Le bon Dieu never could dis. God had only 10. <laughs> but uh, Wilson came with 14, and uh, uh, Wilson's failure, uh, according to Truman, was that he had insulted Henry Cabot Lodge and other people that he did not bring in the delegation. So this led uh, President Truman to forge a really wonderful relationship with Michigan United States Senator Arthur Hendrick Vandenberg. And Vandenberg was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee during that terrible 80th Congress, and uh, uh, Truman was able, by uh, separating out the, uh, the uh, reasonable Republicans that Vandenberg was able to uh, bring to his support, and despite the fact that the 80th Congress was controlled by the Republicans, why, that's the way he got through the uh, Marshall Plan, NATO, and other uh, great measures, including the uh, uh, Truman Doctrine and the aid to Greece and Turkey in March of 1947. So um, I think um, in another aspect, I, I think um, Truman's greatest courage was in the field of civil rights. and. Uh, uh, he did a very clever thing with civil rights it, in his acceptance speech in 1948. He said, uh, uh, he said, I've sent a civil rights uh, message to Congress, and he said, some of the members of my own party object to it, but those Southern Democrats tell you where they stand. It's these hypocrite Republicans that contend they're for civil rights, and then they team up with the segregationists to prevent it from passing. And this, uh, I think, was a very clever move so far as Congress was concerned. And he did his greatest work, of course, with uh, executive orders that went around Congress. But um, that's a kind of a long answer to his relations, but he was able to really build bridges to the reasonable Republicans and who were able, plus the Democrats, to outvote the crazies in the Republican Party. Actually, any, would any of you like to comment on the issue of Truman and Congress? Or? Okay, then we'll go to the next question. If you could please identify yourself. Yes, sir. Congressman Heckler, Morris Wolf, international law teacher, uh, professor, whatever. 
Um, I wonder if you could comment on how Harry Truman evolved such a strong position for the development of the state of Israel. That is, was it this idea that it would be a freedom place, a democracy place? Clearly he was going against the grain of many of the pan-Arabist in the State Department, and uh, which he probably didn't care about. But uh, can you give us what you know about who stimulated his strong support of the development of the state of Israel? The question is, who stimulated Truman's strong support of Israel? Oh, well, <clears throat> as a United States senator, um, Harry Truman made a great speech at the invitation of Rabbi Wise out in Chicago before 20,000 people in which he said he had, uh, <clears throat> from his uh, uh, deep study in, in the masonry that, uh, and his study of the Bible, that uh, he, uh, the Bible had predicted uh, what he was advocating, that the uh, Jewish people deserved a homeland. And... Uh, this is a very dramatic thing uh, which happened when uh, uh, George Marshall, of course, as Secretary of State, uh, John McCloy, and uh, every leader in the Forrestal and the military and State Department uh, uh, arena uh, vigorously objected. In fact, uh, as you recall, uh, uh, President Truman called in General Marshall and called in Clark Clifford and asked them both to present. He asked Clifford specifically to present as though he was giving a lawyer's argument in favor of recognition. And uh, he asked uh, Marshall to uh, present the argument against. And as Clifford spoke, uh, Marshall became redder and redder in the face and finally uh, made the observation that if uh, President Truman recognized Israel, he probably would uh, announce publicly that he couldn't vote for him in the fall. And uh, uh, it was a prelude almost to saying he was going to resign. And uh, it's a very tense moment. And fortunately, we at the White House were able to, uh, uh, through the intervention of Robert Lovett, uh, finally to convince Marshall that uh, the President of the United States had the authority to make a decision and not to be overruled by one of his cabinet members, the Secretary of State. And so finally, they persuaded Marshall to uh, at least to remain silent, but uh, obviously disturbed the fact that this would interrupt our military dependence on Arab oil, which was so important. But um, I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you. Anybody else like to comment on this issue? Uh, I, w I would just add, I've gone through all of Truman um, on his uh, religious faith, and that it's clear that even though he understood the political and strategic implications, and I think he had a lot of strategic reasons for um, recognizing Israel too, that it was um, very important to him because of his faith. And when he talks about his favorite passages from the Bible and all sorts of things, you know, he, he really, he said they're the chosen people, they deserve their own homeland. And, and this is very clear when you look at his private writings. And, and actually then when you look at his press conferences and his speeches in light of what you know that he wrote privately, it all comes together. Thank you. What was that? Was that for me? No, no. Oh. Any other questions? Yeah. If you could wait for the microphone and please identify yourself. Thank John you. Holmfeld, retired congressional staff. Professor Spalding spoke briefly about uh, President Truman's uh, function as an administrator. My question is, to what extent did Senator Truman's experience as chairman during World War II of the Truman Committee that looked into all the procurement issues and all that, help him as an administrator once he became president? To what extent did Truman's um, Senate experience help him as an administrator once he became president? Oh, very much so. Uh, but even more so, of course, it established his reputation uh, and uh, led to um, the agreement by 
FDR uh, in 1944 when the uh, <coughs> boys in the back room uh, <laughs> had come and presented the name of Truman. Truman's, na Truman's picture was on the front page of Time magazine because of his work uh, on the Truman Committee. And uh, I think this uh, helped him not only the way that you suggested, but also particularly uh, helped his national reputation. And uh, uh, and uh, period. <laughs> I'd like to just huh. add uh, just a, a thought to this. One of the reasons that Atchison admired Truman so much, and um, this is an issue in which, in his mind, FDR always suffered by comparison, <clears throat> concerned Truman's orderliness, his preference to having things on paper, um, his being clear about where he was going, um, whereas Roosevelt wanted to keep half a dozen people jumping at the same time before he determined who might win out. Um, that drove Atchison nuts. And when he found that Truman was of a kindred mind and spirit about administration, it added to his admiration for Truman. And he worked Truman hard. I mean, again, it's not always clear that Truman, in my view, does much more than follow the advice that he's given. But Atchison gave him a great deal of advice. I mean, he gave him lots of options. And, and those moments of decision-making usually came after Truman had read dozens and dozens of pages, maybe hundreds, at Atchison's request. Well, you're absolutely right that uh, Truman uh, <clears throat> did not want to follow the Roosevelt pattern of being his own State Department and short-circuiting Cordell Hall through Sumner Wells. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Truman really uh, had a very orderly, organized mind. And uh, he, uh, this was uh, one of the things that Atchison really appreciated. Thank you, yeah, sure. And, and I would add to tie together your question and, and Don's question over there that uh, the, the ability he had in management and administration was tied intimately to his understanding of the institutions. So because of his ten years as senator, he understood Congress. And then he also, because of his study of history, he really did write a lot about the presidency. I mean, sort of in a historical way, but he talked about, you know, who was good, and it was who was good in terms of what they did, but also who was good in terms of how they managed and administrated things. So it's, it's fascinating how it comes back together again, that you can't really separate for Truman his understanding of what we would call now public administration from his understanding of the institutions and how the presidency and Congress go together and what the relationship should be. Thank you. I, uh, I don't want to leave this uh, without some contribution. Uh, there's been a lot about FDR bashing uh, here this afternoon, and uh, I just want to uh, say that uh, FDR, uh, unlike Truman, uh, understood sailing, and uh, FDR had done a lot of uh, skippering of boats, and he understood uh, the ability to tack, T-A-C-K, against the wind in order to go ahead, whereas Truman was always looking for the direct way to go from point A to point B. And uh, I want to add a little footnote to history here, which many of you probably don't know about, but in 1937, it was at the end of September 1937, when FDR was very upset with the majority of people in the United States of America who were isolationists. And he decided to go out to the Chicago, to the shadow of the Chicago Tribune Tower where Colonel McCormick, the chief spokesman for uh, uh, isolation, and he gave a most remarkable speech where he called for a quarantine of aggressors. And it was a tremendous, uh, speech, uh, he didn't say it precisely what he meant by quarantine, but he set the stage. And uh, uh, <clears throat> what happened as a result of that, the State Department was very upset that they had not been consulted before that speech. 
And so when I was in Europe, uh, in Germany, after uh, uh, World War II, I was going through the German archives, and I found a significant memorandum from the German ambassador to the United States saying that he had talked with the people in the State Department and uh, the State Department told the German ambassador not to worry that uh, the State Department was, was going to cut the ground under from under that uh, terribly provocative statement that uh, Roosevelt had made. And so Roosevelt uh, uh, <clears throat> was not only a juggler, I think that uh, he uh, also was a visionary and uh, he made the mistake of trying to do too much for himself and, and never re relying on uh, uh, wise people like uh, Truman did uh, for his decisions. And I think that that's not a weakness of Truman. I think that's a tremendous strength that he was able to assemble some uh, very smart people. Not me, of course, but uh, <laughs> a lot of very smart people that were able to give him advice as the best way to stand. Now, I want to tell one little funny story, if you'll allow me. Uh, uh, there, I don't see any black people in the audience. It's an all-white audience, so you may not understand this. But uh, uh, <clears throat> Truman built a balcony on the White House in 1948 to the outrage of agri architectural purists around the country that said he was only a temporary occupant. And he used to go out there every afternoon after lunch to sun himself and uh, pretty soon he began to develop a pretty deep tan and one of the black ushers came to him and said better watch out Mr. President pretty soon you won't be able to get a room in a first-class hotel <laughs> We're almost out of time, but um, Are there any other final questions? Yeah, we'll take one more down here <clears throat> Yes, for Congressman Heckler, Frank Fletcher again. Um, you shouldn't leave without telling us or describing for us what your duties were in the White House. What were the issues you worked on? What were your duties in the White House and what issues? I started out as a local color man, and the uh, president said, I want you to subscribe to the weekly newspapers of every little uh, <clears throat> town that I'm going to visit, find out what people are talking about, uh, find out if they've got a statue in the town square and who it, who is there, what kind of football team they had. And, uh, you know, he was a very, very poor speaker on uh, major addresses, but uh, on these whistle-stop speeches, uh, he really established a rapport with the audience, and uh, people used to come in from 50 miles away to shoot questions at him, and it was a, it was a educational experience. But... It just sort of developed for them from then. Uh, uh, he used to ask me to go out in the crowd and listen to what people were saying. And of course, if the crowd was very quiet, well, every now and then I would yell, give him hell, Harry. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this, this, would, uh, <laughs> this would spice up the crowd. But I did a, a great deal of liaison with uh, members of Congress to make sure that they had uh, good research materials on the issues and also with sub-cabinet members that uh, needed information so that everybody could get on the same page uh, with his policy. And this developed pretty soon into actual speech writing itself. And uh, uh, occasionally, uh, well, here's a good State Department story. Uh, um, President Truman asked me one day to put together a pamphlet called Our Foreign Policy. And so naturally, you know, who's in charge of foreign policy? You know, we asked the State Department, they came up with this terribly turgid uh, multi-page report that, uh, <laughs> and uh, President Truman said, uh, come on, put this in Missouri English so people can understand it. And so I had the job of rewriting the Our Foreign Policy and it, uh, <laughs> Uh, and a very popular pamphlet that uh, that actually sold and was circulated very widely. But uh, I did a lot of uh, speech writing, particularly uh, during the 1952 campaign, which was a, a kind of a hopeless effort. Uh, um, there's somebody here earlier who was uh, 
working for I oh yeah working for Ike at the time and uh, uh, that was a that was a tough campaign to to run and Truman uh, never could uh, really appreciate Adlai Stevenson either and um, the difference between Truman and Stevenson was that uh, um, you almost felt that Truman's decisions sometimes came from his viscera because he had an instinctive reaction to uh, something and he could smell a rat a mile away. And uh, Stevenson thought with his head and this is why a lot of people called him indecisive because sometimes he thought of the various alternatives. Uh, but um, that's uh, maybe a subject for another uh, uh, symposium on the relations. Thank you. Do you have any further uh, statements? Then let me uh, thank our um, panelists, in particular Congressman Heckler, for his presentations. <laughs> let me. <laughs> Let me invite all of you to a small reception, some wine and some food over courtesy of Mike Devine in the Truman Library Museum and Institute. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, again, there's a follow-up discussion on a couple of the books on H. Diplo, yeah, I'm a and there, um, I don't think I missed uh, the Commons. I uh, David Painter I will yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, also have more time to elaborate his views that I could only do uh, inadequate service in impersonating today. Um, thank you for joining us, and. Um,